This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Outrage in the Gambia over a move to free three self-confessed hitmen of former ruler Yaya Jami. What we must not do is to scare people away from telling the truth. There are still many truths out there that need to be told. Yet another peace deal after decades of conflict, former rebel group Renamo signed an accord with the Mozambican government. Another charge for Ugandan musician turned MP Bobby Wine, this time for annoying the president. Also in the program, it's a family affair. Meet the Olympic swimmers hoping to make a splash for Cape Verde. We can fool around with each other, like, oh, Jill, I'm about to be on this one. She'll be like, no, you ain't. She always <laughs> has something that annoys yeah. <laughs> And in sports, with just two weeks to go to the Africa Games in Morocco, a trip, a road trip is underway to promote the event. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. There is outrage in the Gambia over plans to release three hitmen who confessed to carrying out a series of assassinations under the orders of former President Yaya Jame. The three are members of a paramilitary group known as the Junglers. Malik Jata, Omar Jalo, and Amadou Baji confessed to being government assassins. Now, the revelations came at a Truth and Reconciliation and Reparations Commission hearing set up by the current president, Adam Abaru, in December 2017, after he came into power. But the first hearing did not begin until January this year. Since then, at least 50 people have given evidence to the TRRC, and it will run for two years. The BBC's Thomas Nadi reports. Enoch Amu Mesa was 10 years old when his father was killed in the Gambia. He was one of the 44 Ghanaian nationals murdered by the Janglers, a paramilitary unit which took direct orders from former President Yaya Jame. But how does he feel about the intended release of the three men? The real man behind it is what we have to deal with, the Jame. If Jame didn't say that I killed them, they won't do that. I get the So to me, with their, with their release, I think it's a fair deal, but we need to go for the, what they call it, the real man, who is the Jame. The three men appeared before the country's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission two weeks ago. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. They confessed Perhaps to committing dozens of assassinations, including the murder of over 40 Ghanaians. Now they are about to be set free. The three men are currently in military custody, and the authorities believe that their release will encourage others to also testify as they seek to establish the truth. But the problem is that they haven't set conditions for their release, and so there are concerns they might leave the country. A move that has angered many of the relatives of the victims in the Gambia. It's been a long time, long year ago. Nobody knows. So at least time it's not any the justice. It's just need a grass as easy as as this. Understand, God. He will affect so many families. To understand what actually happened there, we need to, you know encourage those people who are responsible for those heinous acts to come forward and then tell the Gambian public what is happening. So in the interest of finding out the truth, yeah, I think it was the right decision. Jame to Justice Ghana campaign group is also unhappy about it. The position of the victims, um, their feelings should, I believe, should have been taken into account uh, in order that even if that they were going to be Relieved, certain concessions that had to be made should have been explained more to the victims uh, than um, what we know now. The commission has only begun its work and is expected to make recommendations for prosecution or reparation. It has two years to prove to families of the victims that justice can be done in Gambia. Thomas Nadi, BBC News. All the hearings are being broadcast in full in the Gambia. I asked Ade Darami from our partner stations QTV what impact these revelations have had on society. If you come to the Gambia or you see the Gambia advertised in Europe or in America, it talks very much about the smiling coast, um, about this place where everybody's laid back and friendly and so on. And that's very much how people have always seen themselves and, and it, to an extent still see themselves. However, the revelations have been of such a brutal, 
shocking, horrifying nature, and it's actually getting people to question themselves uh, to the extent where, if I'm honest, there are even some people who even now keep saying things like uh, the perpetrators could not possibly have been Gambians. Um, I traveled back from Europe just a month ago, and uh, the person sitting next to me on the plane, a professor, a Gambian chap, was saying to me, of course, you realize that all the perpetrators uh, can't have been Gambians. And I said, well, the commission has seen 50 plus witnesses. Not a single foreigner has been named as having been a perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So there is that sense of denial uh, about you know who's been involved. But I think now people are beginning to realize that, yes, it was Gambians doing this mainly to other Gambians and in some cases to foreigners, uh, you know, people from other countries. So are they, the, the, the commission itself is, is called the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. So in the light of yes. what's happened uh, with the three so-called junglers, yes. is, it, is, it, is it happening? Is it working, do you think? I think it's working and it's, it's working slowly uh, because particularly with the junglers, because of course this was a, a set of people who were essentially ex-President Jammer's hit squad. Uh, he recruited a certain type of individual, um, somebody who would be able to carry out uh, work at his behest, mainly uh, eliminations, torture, assassinations, uh, really, of everybody from you know political opponents, uh, perceived uh, coupists, to just journalists. I mean, he had a particular thing against journalists, and, and he really hated journalists and in fact famously uh, referred to journalists as the illegitimate sons of Africa because of the kind of criticism that he was getting from journalists. Uh, and so, you know, this is the, the, you know, where and why we find ourselves, you know, where we are now. Yeah. How, about, how about the reparations part of it? Because usually in tribunals like this, the commissions like this, um, two or three of their mandates really never get completed or finished. <laughs> In fact, in most of them, as a Sierra Leonean, I can tell you that in, in, in Sierra Leone, we're still waiting for those to be finished. But, you know, I have a Gambian connection. My father was born here. But in terms of reparations, actually, what people are looking for is not financial recompense. Uh, some people have even come to the commission and said, actually, what we would like is an apology for what was done to us or what was done to our family member. Um, so, you know, the, I think when you hear the word reparations, uh, there's a there's kind of automatic, you, you think that people mean cash or some sort of financial recompense. But I've been quite surprised, even shocked, that some people have said that actually, you know, what we want is an apology from the perpetrators, but also an explanation of what happened to our family member. Because what happened in many cases that people disappeared and all sorts of nonsensical reasons were given by the regime or, you know, we did have them in custody, but they escaped and we don't know where they are. Of course, now we find out that not only do they know where they are, but Literally, we know where the bodies are buried. Well, let's now take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa. It's been revealed that Zimbabwe's former leader, Robert Mugabe, has been in hospital in Singapore for the last four months. His successor, President Emerson Munangagwa, said he was receiving treatment for an undisclosed ailment and was responding well, but doctors thought it's best to keep him under observation for much longer than initially expected. And the president added that Mr. Mugabe could be released fairly soon. Roughly half the population of Burundi has malaria. That's according to a report by the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Over five and a half million cases of malaria have been recorded in the country so far this year. 1,800 of them have been fatal. Malawians have taken to the streets in Blantyre, Mzuzu and Lilongwe to protest over last May's elections. President Peter Mutarika was narrowly elected to a second term, but demonstrators from Human Rights Defenders Coalition say the election was riddled with irregularities and are demanding the resignation of a number of Malawi Electoral Commission officials. Now, a peace accord has been signed today in Mozambique, designed to put an end to a civil war that was supposed to have finished three decades ago. The opposition Renamo party has agreed to disarm its fighters in return for constitutional concessions from the government. Well, let's get the latest now on this. I'm joined by Milton Nkosi in Johannesburg. Milton, help us understand why this is significant. This is significant because it brings an end to a 27-year 
old civil war in Mozambique. Sophie, you will recall that the rebels Renamo signed uh, three other agreements which collapsed, and they are hoping that this one w will work. In 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 essence, what has been agreed today is that the rebels Renamo will disarm their uh, uh, troops, their guerrilla army, about 5,200 of them, and also they will be integrated into the military or into civilian life. And the government will also try and seize hostilities against the uh, rebel Renamo. So that is the agreement today. President Cyril Ramaphosa from neighboring South Africa also attended the ceremony. I wonder, though, politically, how this will impact on the country. So the uh, Frelimo, which is the governing party, um, has been engaged in this on and off uh, civil war with Renamo. And they're hoping that it will unleash the economic development that Mozambique so desperately needs, especially after the cyclone disasters that we saw this year. Remember that the Mozambicans are hoping to hold a general election in October. So um, this will be the test of this agreement, whether it will hold or not. Within Renamo, there are, there's a breakaway group which is still uh, very much loyal to its uh, former leader Afonso Lakama who passed away last year uh, in 2017 and they say that they will not disarm so that will be the test whether they have the strength to uh, derail this peace agreement which has been welcomed by regional leaders as well. Milton Nkosi for us in Johannesburg thank you thank you. Now, the Ugandan musician turned politician Robert Changulani, also known as Bobby Wine, is facing yet another legal challenge. He's been charged with intending to annoy President Yoweri Museveni. If found guilty, he faces life imprisonment. He's already on trial for treason in a separate case. The BBC's patient Atuhaire reports from Kampala. The most serious charge is intending to annoy, alarm, and ridicule the president. And this relates to a by-election rally in the northwestern town of Arua, where Bobby Wine and his colleagues are alleged to have refused to get out of the way of the presidential convoy. Someone in the crowd is said to have thrown a stone at one of the presidential cars, and they broke one of the windows. And according to the penal code, annoying the president could attract a life sentence. Bobby Wine is charged alongside 36 other people, including four other MPs, activists and ordinary people who were swept up in that dragnet when those arrests were carried out last year. Other charges include inciting violence and in this case Bobby Wine is accused of having called on his supporters to physically harm the president. One of the other MPs is also accused of possessing a firearm. Bobby Wine himself still faces other charges in a different court for staging a protest against a law that imposed attacks on mobile money transactions and the use of social media. Patience at Heire, BBC News, Kampala. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, another African player could be on his way to the English Premier League. Find out more in sports. I'm Sophie Ikenye, and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top stories on this program, three self-confessed hitmen of former Gambian President Yaya Jame are set to be released by the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Committee. Relatives of those murdered are said to be furious at the decision. Now, a peace accord has been signed in Mozambique between former rebel group Renamo and the government. It's designed to put an end to a decades-long civil war. You're watching BBC Focus in Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport, Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. With just two weeks to go before the kickoff, preparations are in top gear for the 12th edition of the Africa Games in Morocco. Over 7,000 athletes from the continent will compete for medals across 26 sports from the 19th to the 31st of August. 17 of those sports will be qualifiers for next year's Olympics in Tokyo. Morocco are back competing at the Games after missing the last eight editions and organizers are embarking on a road trip across the country to raise awareness. They've also assured that everything is ready.
We found little things that are all taken care of now on all levels, uh, whether it is the infrastructures or the training of the volunteers. Uh, some very, very good results have been achieved here in Morocco on absolutely everything that they agree with us. Now let's bring you some transfer news now. Senegal defender Pape Soiré has joined French League Two side Trois from English Premier League club Crystal Palace. The 29-year-old has signed until June 2020 with an option for another year. A shoulder injury in January meant Soiré played just four times for Palace last season and only once in the Premier League. He'll join Tunisia international Johan Tuzga, who has extended his contract with Troyes until, with Troyes rather, until uh, 2022. The 32 year old Ford made 34 league appearances last season and has already featured twice this season in League Two. Mali midfielder Suleiman Diara has signed a three year deal at Turkish club Gazasehir Gaziantep from French club Lens. The 24 year old played in two of Mali's qualifiers for the Africa Cup of Nations but was not included in their squad for the finals in Egypt. Uh, Egyptian side Tanta have confirmed the acquisition of Kenya international John Avir on a permanent deal. The top flight side have not disclosed the details of the deal for the forward who joins from Kenyan club Sofa Paka. The 22-year-old featured in two of Kenya's matches at the recent Cup of Nations in Egypt. Congolese international Ngonda Muzinga has agreed terms with French Ligue 1 side Dijon, the fullback who plays for AS Vita Club in the DR Congo, featured in the Nations Cup. The left fullback is waiting at the moment for paperwork from the French Embassy in Kinshasa. And Senegalese international Ismail Assar is on the verge of signing with English Premier League side Watford for club record fee of $35 million. The 21 year old winger scored 13 goals and delivered 11 assists in all competitions last season and has 21 caps for his country. Sophie, who would you like your team to sign? You know what? I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> you never do, do you? <laughs> Thanks for the sport, Peter. Thank you. Now, did you know that Africa's most successful Olympian is not a runner, as you might imagine, but a swimmer? Although Zimbabwe's Kirsty Co Coventry has won a total of seven medals at the Games, it's not a sport you'd normally associate with the continent. But one family is hoping to change all that as the first swim squad representing Cape Verde. At first, I did not believe it. I thought it was a joke. I said, there's no way. Someone needs to still pinch me because I still don't believe it. My children are going to the Olympic. Latoya Troy and Jay Lapina have all been selected for Cape Verde's first ever Olympic swimming team. The country is only sending one other swimmer to the Olympics. We can fool around with each other like, oh, Jill, I'm about to be on this one. She'll be like, no, you ain't. She always <laughs> has something that annoys yeah. you. <laughs> The three of them have never been to Cape Verde and grew up in Seekonk, Massachusetts. But they were discovered by Cape Verdean officials after their mother, who was born in Cape Verde, posted her children's swimming times on Facebook. We grew up listening to Cape Verdean music. For us, it's nothing different, really. It's good to put out the name of Cape Verde into the world and to like want people to say, I'm Cape Verdean. Cape Verde has never won an Olympic medal. Latroya Troy and Jayla want to use this opportunity to start a program in Cape Verde to help kids into swimming who in many cases never get the chance to learn. It's all parents' dream. They, they're very successful. They achieved anything they put their hands into. They don't quit. They make mommy proud. I'm so proud. And being a single mom, doing it by myself, actually we did it together. In 2016, Simone Manuel became the first black female swimmer to win an Olympic gold medal. But the black community is still underrepresented in swimming. Obviously facilities, you know, um, being able to go to these places and actually train with the team, like it's really expensive. 
and even just swimsuits and goggles and tech suits, like all of that is a cost as well. Though Troya was actually the first in her family to learn how to swim. Minorities don't like to get their hair messed up. It's a big thing that a lot of us know of. And people ask me all the time, you know, how do you keep up with your hair? It's, it is a lot to keep up with your hair, but once you're in swimming, you figure it out. And obviously the stereotype that black people don't swim, but we all can do the same thing if we just put our minds to it. Now, the author, Toni Morrison, the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, has died at the age of 88 after a short illness. She won many awards for her work about black American life, including the Pulitzer Prize for her novel, Beloved. David Silito looks back at her life. I don't mean that there were no narratives that slave women told, and there was no information about them. I mean, it wasn't the narrative in literature. My effort in saying beloved to do that, to talk about a woman who had to make some choices. Toni Morrison and Beloved, a story of slavery and grief, the sort of book Toni Morrison wanted to read but had to write herself. 30 years on, its success is more than about just sales or being part of the school syllabus. It's what it's done to help tell the untold. She had the ability and the genius to create a world that had not existed before. And not only that, a quintessentially American world. She is an American writer. She's an African-American writer. There's my house. Toni Morrison had grown up in Lorain, Ohio, and she made it to Cornell University. Her grandparents had been sharecroppers in the Deep South. You could go to jail or be fined if you were white and taught a black person to read. That says it all about reading. So my family took the whole thing very seriously. It was like a revolutionary act. She began writing in the 60s. Her first novel, The Bluest Eye, was a story of childhood, black childhood, in a white world. Each night without fail, she prayed for blue eyes. Fervently, for a year, she had prayed. 23 years later, Toni Morrison was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. Just one of a mantelpiece full of awards. There was, she said, a vacuum in literature, summed up by that little girl in the bluest eye. It took five years for me to write that really small book to pay attention to this child. It may be, maybe she's in difficulty. She's obviously hurt. Uh, she's abused and misused. But take her seriously, please. Tony Moore is on there. Before we go now, a quick look at our top story on Focus on Africa. There's been outrage in the Gambia over plans to release three hitmen who confessed to carrying out a series of assassinations under the order of former President Yaya Jami. The three are members of a paramilitary group known as the Junglers. Malik Jata, Omar Jalo, and Amadou Baji confessed to being government assassins. Now, the revelations came at a Truth, Reconciliation, and Reparations Commission hearing set up by the current President Adam Abaru in December 2017 after he came into power, ending Mr. Jami's 22 year rule. And don't forget, you can catch up with all the latest news and current affairs on our website. That's bbc.com forward slash Africa. And also catch up with me on social media. I'm Atsi Kenyu. That's it for now. Thanks for your company.